to use a, an Australian co colloquialism, I'm going to bend your ear for a little while about nitrous oxide. Um, it's, uh, it's a topic which is in a state of, of very rapid evolution, I think, despite the fact that we, for a long time, I think, thought that we knew everything there was to know about this, this particular agent. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we all know that uh, it's got some unique properties, which I, I don't need to lecture to this audience about. Um, its analgesic properties and its cardiorespiratory stability uh, are well known to us. And it has held a, uh, a useful place in anaesthesia for a large part of the last 200 years since its, its invention. Um, back in the uh, days when I was starting my anaesthetics training, back when a lot of anaesthetic machines still looked like this, um, the, uh, it was, it was, its use was pretty much routine. There had to be a specific reason not to turn on nitrous oxide. And the reason for that was because we liked its, its rapid pharmacokinetics, its um, not max sparing but dose sparing uh, uh, effects on the, um, the, the amount of the uh, accompanying volatile agent that we had to use. Um, there was, a, there was a, a modest list of fairly uncommon situations where it was contraindicated. <coughs> Things have changed a lot since that time, of course, and um, I'm just going to walk through what I, know, what I would see as the current um, state of knowledge about nitrous oxide and its, and its place, uh, discuss its, its place in future practice. Um, one of the first things which um, changed the risk-benefit equation for nitrous oxide uh, was increasing awareness uh, going back to the 1990s that it was a contributor to post-operative nausea and vomiting. Um, there are a couple of meta-analyses uh, of the literature available at that time. This one by Martin Tramer uh, was one of the most widely quoted. And it, and it um, pointed out that uh, nitrous oxide did seem to contribute to post-operative nausea and vomiting. Um, my colleague Paul Miles at the Alfred in Melbourne um, became convinced that uh, the toxicity of nitrous oxide, which relates to its, um, its known... Uh, in irreversible and progressive inhibition and methionine synthetase activity might be contributing to toxicity peri uh, and in complications in patients on a more routine basis than those unusual uh, situations where traditionally we, we, we thought it was contraindicated. Um, consequently, we conducted the, uh, the first of the Enigma trials, which randomised 2,000 patients to a nitrous or nitrous-free anaesthetic. And that trial, in fact, confirmed that patients having Routine major surgery were, in fact, at increased risk of both wound and pulmonary complications, as well as an increased incidence of uh, what was defined as severe post-operative nausea and vomiting. Um, as the, one of the other findings from Enigma 1 was a... Um, it, it, Enigma 1 was not trial to look at um, myocardial complications, but there was a, a tantalising trend toward, towards an increased incidence of, of uh, myocardial infarction in the nitrous oxide group. And this is consistent with the hypothesis that the progressive rise in homocysteine levels that's produced by methionine synthetase inhibition uh, might, would be contributing to this complication. This, uh, uh, homocysteine causes endothelial dysfunction and, uh, and is a known risk factor for uh, cardiovascular complications, including cardiac complications. And consequently, we've embarked on the Enigma 2 trial. Now, Enigma 2 is, is very close to finishing. In fact, we may actually be closing recruitment for Enigma 2 uh, this week, uh, having uh, uh, randomised some 7,000 patients to a nitrous or nitrous-free anaesthetic. And, and hopefully very, very soon we'll have some, some news for you about um, the, the findings of Enigma 2. So, uh, so watch this space. Um, the other emerging trend, of course, has been increasing public awareness of the importance of, of, um, of climate change and greenhouse gas pollution. And nitrous oxide we know is a potent greenhouse gas. Um, and with the availability of the more modern volatile agents with their faster pharmacokinetics, um, the, uh, the place of nitrous oxide was increasingly seen as, 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 as obsolete. Um, just as by way of background, my, my, my interest in nitrous oxide, funnily enough, comes from my interest in, in non-invasive non cardiac output monitoring, which is one of the things I'll be speaking of um, in, in Ghent and, and, and Louvain later this uh, or next week. Um, I'm, I've, I'll, I'll report the progress of, of a project that I've been pursuing for a while now using CO2 elimination to, to provide continuous uh, cardiac output monitoring uh, in ventilated patients during surgery. Um, but initially we started off uh, looking for ways of adapting the traditional nitrous oxide rebreathing technique for measuring pulmonary blood flow 
to, uh, to ventilated patients. And this involved getting stuck into some fairly hefty computer modelling of the pharmacokinetics of nitrous oxide in the lungs. And I developed some, um, what I felt were fairly sophisticated computer models um, uh, at the time, which I built from scratch, uh, which were adapted, they, they took um, techniques of computer modelling which have been well described by our colleagues in, the, in uh, respiratory physiology and adapted these to anaesthesia scenarios to basically fill a knowledge gap. Um, and in particular, what these sort of models need to do is they need to be able to look at the effects of st typical levels of ventilation, perfusion, scatter. Because this happens in all anaesthetised patients. Even young, fit, healthy patients develop significant VQ scatter during inhalational anaesthesia. And the models need to be able to model that using multi-compartment modelling uh, and, and predict the outcomes in terms of the effects on gas exchange. And, and I found some... In I, that these models predicted some interesting findings which which I then go on to try and demonstrate using um, uh, uh, some s simple clinical studies. Um, I'll just talk about some pharmacokinetics first, and then I'll go on to talk about some, some important pharmacodynamic issues with nitrous oxide. Um, Severinghaus told us uh, 50 years ago that the uh, pattern of uptake of nitrous oxide would follow an exponential uh, function such as this with a very high rate of initial uptake. Um, if you're turning, up, turning on 70% um, inspired nitrous oxide, then the initial rate of uptake is as high as one litre a minute, and that rapidly declines uh, over the ensuing minutes uh, as the body starts to saturate with, with nitrous oxide. And uh, colleagues at, uh, at the time, back in the 1960s, surmised that this might have an effect on the way that the accompanying uh, volatile agents and, and indeed al alveolar oxygen were, uh, were taken up by the lungs by at least drawing in further fresh gas to replace uh, the gas that's been taken up by blood. And they coined the term the second gas effect for this phenomenon. The real mechanism for this effect was in fact elucidated a short time later by Ted Eager and, um, and his colleagues. And it's in fact a concentrating effect. And this simple block diagram is, is still uh, reproduced in, in the textbooks to try and explain this concept in a simple way. And it just describes a simple one compartment lung in which half the nitrous oxide is suddenly taken up. Um, and in the process, the concentration of the alveolar oxygen and the second gas or volatile agent increases from 1% to 1.7%. It's a simple concentrating effect, simple mechanism. This increase in, uh, in uh, alveolar concentration and partial pressure is then reflected in the partial pressures which are transmitted to pulmonary blood and, and go to the brain and and contribute to depth of anaesthesia. And so it was surmised that the second gas effect was a mechanism by which nitrous oxide could accelerate the rate of induction and achievement of, of uh, maintenance phase uh, anaesthesia depth. And there have been several studies in the meantime which have shown that this actually happens. This is, this is real. Um, a study by the grand old man himself on the left there looking at the effect of nitrous oxide uh, uptake on the rate of rise of uh, alveolar partial pressure as a fraction of the inspired FA over FI. Uh, for desflurane, um, and a similar study by Jan's group, uh, Jan and Andre, looking at the effect of uh, nitrous oxide inclusion as the carrier gas on the rate of rise of FA over FI for sevoflurane. And in both, in both these studies, and in others as well, um, there is a, a modest acceleration in the rate of rise of FA over FI for the volatile agent, where nitrous oxide, at concentration of 60 or 70 per cent, is the carrier gas. Uh, this is the second gas effect happening. Um, the effect that you measure when you're measuring end tidal or alveolar concentrations is in the order of 10% and it tails off to about 5% after some minutes when the rate of uptake of nitrous oxide starts to decrease. Now there have been some outliers in this body of work, uh, unfortunately, and this, uh, this stuff unfortunately finds its way into the textbooks um, and has an inordinate influence on, on uh, undergraduate teaching, I have to say. Um, one group um, was unable to demonstrate any second gas effect in, in their own study. And this, this study had some influence because they, this was the only group that took the trouble to measure the partial pressure of the volatile agent in arterial blood as well as in the entitled tidal breath. Um, and for some reason they couldn't generate a second gas effect in either the entitled tidal breath or in arterial blood. Um, I'm not quite sure why because as I'll go on to explain to you, this is not rocket science. This is really simple. You can do this on Monday when you go back to work on your next operating list using standard monitoring equipment. This is not esoteric, you don't need a grass chromatograph, you don't need to have a PhD to do this, right? This is so simple. Start off with a typical steady state inhalational anaesthetic, an oxygen air mixture 
with your favourite volatile agent. In this case, we've got some desflurane. Um, and we'll start off with an, uh, an inspired oxygen concentration of about 30% in air. Turn up your fresh gas flows to a high to a, a high flow so that you get a rapid wa washout when we make the next step of the proceeding. So here we are. This is we're at steady state. We've got desflurane with an end tidal uh, concentration of 6.4%, an inspired concentration of 7%, uh, an inspired oxygen concentration of 30% in air, and, a, and an expired tidal volume of, of 630 mils. And just switch over to a high flow of oxygen and nitrous oxide and just watch what happens. This is what happens. Within a few breaths, your expired tidal volume will plummet by about 50 or 100 mils, as has happened here. It's gone from 630 to 550. That's the uptake of nitrous oxide happening right before your eyes. And in the process, within, within the space of a minute or so, you'll actually see that your end tidal concentrations for both oxygen and your volatile agent will have risen by probably about 20% or thereabouts. Um, everything else remaining stable and, and no other changes being made. This is the second gas effect happening. It's not hard to reproduce. It's very simple pharmacokinetics. Um, to, get, to try and get the science of this right, I embarked on a series of, of, um, of small clinical studies in patients having inhalational anaesthesia to actually measure the magnitude of the second gas effect that I was predicting from my computer modelling. Um, we did a number of studies, but um, uh, the first methodological thing is you need to actually master the technique of measuring partial pressures of volatile agents in arterial blood. It's actually quite simple. Once, it's one of those things, once you know how to do it, it's quite easy. Um, you need a 20 mil glass syringe, you need a blood sample, and you need a, a, a warm water bath, a rocking warm water bath that you can equilibrate the blood sample with uh, 10 mils of headspace gas and then you just measure the partial pressure of the agent in that headspace gas um, using a, um, a gas analyzer. Um, most studies use gas chromatography. Uh, I published this paper in Anesthesia and Analgesia. Just to demonstrate, you can actually do this with a conventional clinical gas analyzer and get a high quality measurement um, using simple equipment as well. Um, so having done all that, um, we then embarked on, on some uh, series of studies. This is, this is one of the studies. This is a, a small study of randomising 14 patients to get either sevoflurane in oxygen versus sevoflurane in nitrous oxide in oxygen, um, control ventilation, and, and measure the magnitude of the second gas effect in both entidal gas and arterial blood. Um, we took, uh, having uh, stabilised the patient's uh, control ventilation, we then turned on the randomised gas mixture and took serial blood samples at 2, 5, 10 and 30 minutes and measured in tidal concentrations at the same time using our trusty Datex Capnomac for all the measurements. <coughs> and this is what you find. So this is alveolar or end tidal partial pressure. The heavy line is the nitrous oxide group. So we, we demonstrated very similar results to the previous studies done by, by other groups. You see at, at, at the two minute mark, the nitrous oxide group have a roughly 10% acceleration in the rate of rise of FA, FA over FI, and that tails off to about 6% after 30 minutes or so. That's just what we already know about this, uh, this phenomenon. If you look what happens in arterial blood, it's much more interesting. Now, the partial pressures are all much lower. Right? There's all, for any gas that's been taken up in the presence of VQ scatter in the lungs, you're going to have AA gradients for the partial pressures for that gas. And so the partial pressures are all lower in arterial blood. But the difference between the nitrous group and the nitrous-free group is much greater. In actual fact, in the first few minutes of your uh, nitrous oxide anaesthetic, the rate of rise of arterial partial pressure is in fact almost 25% faster in arterial blood. So the effect is actually more potent when you look at what, ha what happens in blood as opposed to the expired breath. And even at 30 minutes, the effect was persisting. There was still more than, more than a 10% difference between the two groups at the 30 minute mark when the uptake of nitrous oxide should have tailed off to a, fair, uh, to a much lower level. So to summarise, the magnitude of the second gas effect on arterial blood, which is what matters, that's what's going to the brain and putting you to sleep, um, is in fact two or three times more powerful than we thought previously. And the reason for this is in fact due to the presence of VQ scatter, which sounds a bit counterintuitive, but I'll explain to you why, why this happens with a, a simple modification of Eager's original diagram. 
Vega and Stolting's diagram. So there's the original diagram showing a second gas effect concentrating our, our volatile agent from 1% to 1.7% with the uptake of nitrous oxide. Now let's just add some blood flow to this diagram. So this is a, this is a one compartment lung, so the concentrations in blood leaving the lung are the same as those in the alveolar compartment. So we've got 1.7% volatile agent in, in, in blood, uh, arterial blood. Now let's introduce some VQ mismatch. Let's take three quarters of the blood flow and distribute it to half of the lung and leave one quarter of the blood flow to the other half of the lung. The uptake of nitrous oxide is perfusion driven, so let's let three quarters of that uptake occur in the part of the lung that's receiving all the blood flow and only one quarter to the remainder of the lung. The arithmetic is very simple. When you crunch the numbers, you work out that the expected concentration of volatile agent in blood leaving the lung now is in fact 2.2%, not 1.7%. So it's actually, the effect is more powerful because the concentrating effect that's happening is happening in a more restricted part of the lung. That's the part of the lung that's getting all the blood flow, right? It's, these, it's, these lung, it's those parts of the lung which have moderately low VQ ratios, which get the lion's share of pulmonary blood flow, and they determine the content of pulmonary blood and arterial blood. So in a very simplistic way, and, and the more sophisticated models actually predict, predict this, of course, as well, but in a very simplistic way, this simple diagram explains why the second gas effect is more powerful when measured on, in blood than it is in, in tidal gas. Um, as I said, the effect persists right throughout the, 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 um, the anaesthetic. Uh, it's not, not a brief or short-lived uh, uh, effect at all. But at the end of the operation, the same thing happens, but in the opposite direction. And you get, instead of a concentrating effect, when you turn off the nitrous oxide, the rapid washout of nitrous oxide produces, as we all know from the traditional teaching associated with the concept of diffusion hypoxia. Um, interestingly, Fink described diffusion hypoxia in, in the 1950s before the second gas effect was described by, um, by colleagues in the 1960s. Um, but the concept of dilutional um, d uh, nitrous oxide diluting the other alveolar gases is well known. And uh, what hasn't, hadn't been looked at really was the effect this had on, volat on the volatile agent um, in the alveolar compartment as well. They'd looked at oxygen but not, uh, not uh, volatile agents. And so I repeated this, the study, very similar methodology to the previous study uh, where we basically measured um, the serial fall in, the in, in partial pressures of sevoflurane in patients randomised to a nitrous, uh, a nitrous oxide anaesthetic uh, for maintenance anaesthesia or a nitrous free anaesthetic. And once again, a very similar pattern but, but in, in the opposite direction. So the rate of fall of sevoflurane in those first few minutes after the uh, nitrous oxide and the uh, volatile agent are turned off is uh, significantly uh, faster where nitrous oxide has been the carrier gas than is the case if uh, a nitrous free mixture has been uh, administered for the, for the anaesthetic. Um, as I said, similar mechanism the effect on arterial blood is more powerful than what you measure in the end tidal breath for the same reasons we spoke about before. Um, and in fact, it was interesting that the effect appeared to be maintained at the 30 minute mark in the recovery room in the patient. We took some blood samples from the patients in the recovery room. Uh, and in fact, you could demonstrate even in this small sample of patients that the uh, consequences of that were a quicker time to uh, wake up and extubation in the nitrous oxide group, which confirms our long standing clinical impressions that. Uh, that nitrous oxide contributes to a faster emergence. So there's two reasons why you actually wake up more quickly from a nitrous oxide based anaesthetic. One is the dose sparing effect. You've been giving the patient less, vol uh, less volatile agent throughout the anaesthetic, so they're starting off at, at a lower base in terms of volatile partial pressures. But also there's an accelerated washout happening. And probably the contribution of those two things is about 50-50 to the achievement of a lower, or a basically achievement of MAC awake for, for your volatile agent. Um, so just to summarise on the pharmacokinetics, nitrous oxide does induce powerful and persisting second gas effects. Um, this doesn't necessarily require a high volume uptake of nitrous oxide to be happening. The effect is predominantly arterial. What we measure in end tidal or alveolar gas is a heavily diluted version of that and that's because of the, con the contribution of alveolar dead space gas to the end tidal breath. Alveolar dead space uh, doesn't contribute, contribute to gas exchange, of course, so it dilutes the, uh, the effect you measure. 
and it's contributed to by typical levels of VQ scatter that you see in these types of patients. All right, um, enough about pharmacokinetics. I'm going, to I'm going to talk about something a bit more tangible. Let's talk about vomiting. Um, the, as I said, the, the literature supports the concept that nitrous oxide contributes to postoperative nausea and vomiting. Um, if you look at this body of literature, it's, there are numerous studies. Most of them are hopelessly underpowered. Um, the most recent meta-analysis had 29 studies, and 23 of those had less than 100 patients in them. Um, and I have to say, I think there's an enormous potential for publication bias to be contributing to this particular finding. But, but I'll ex certainly, I, don't, I accept the notion that nitrous oxide is a metagenic. The, the elephant in the room with this question, though, it seems to me, if you look at the literature, is, the, is duration of exposure to nitrous oxide. Um, this is unpublished data. It's with the journals at the moment, so, but I, I thought I'd take the opportunity to, give, to basically give, give you a sneak peek at, uh, at what we've done. We've, we've basically done a, a meta-regression modelling of all the published studies which have randomised um, patients to either a nitrous oxide anaesthetic or a nitrous free anaesthetic. So a very similar body of literature to what is being uh, uh, published as, as meta-analysis up until now, but specifically looking at the relationship between the risk ratio of, of nausea and vomiting related to nitrous oxide in those studies versus the length of the anaesthetic. And what you get is a very clear relationship. Um, the slope of the relationship is such that, in actual fact, if the anaesthetic goes for less than an hour, and there have been, there have been uh, a number of large studies which have looked at these briefer, briefer surgeries, um, the number needed to treat is, it's over 100, it's tiny. There's no clinically significant emetogenic effect from nitrous oxide under an hour of exposure. However, at the other end of the scale, prolonged exposure to nitrous oxide in major surgery, such as the Enigma trial, Enigma, Enigma 1 is, is up here, um, seems, to, seems to indicate significant post-op nausea and vomiting from nitrous oxide exposure, with a number needed to treat of only nine. So the slope of this relationship is, is roughly that the risk of nitrous oxide-induced PONV increases by about 20% per hour after about an hour, for half an hour to an hour. So I put to you that the data actually suggests that nitrous oxide use is, in, in terms of post-op nausea and vomiting, nitrous oxide is not contraindicated for brief or minor surgery. It doesn't contribute to nausea and vomiting. In fact, it doesn't uh, really seem to have any significant toxicity at all because the methionine synthetase uh, issue, of course, is related to more prolonged exposure. Um, the other thing that this raises, the question this raises, is what is actually the mechanism of nitrous oxide-induced nausea and vomiting? The traditional uh, explanations, which are all merely surmised, they're not, they're not proven, are uh, things like um, effect on opioid and dopamine, dopamine receptors in the brain. Uh, if, if it did have a, a metagenic effect due to that mechanism, it would be very quick. It would be happening during brief surgery. Um, middle ear uh, pressures is the other mechanism. But once again, the studies show that middle ear pressures peak very quickly. Within about 20 minutes, they peak in a nitrous oxide anaesthetic. So that's not consistent with this data either. Bowel distension probably is consistent with this data because that can be more progressive and, 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 and a slower onset. But there's another mechanism which, which we've completely overlooked, and that's the, the possibility that the derangement of methionine and homocysteine metabolism related to methionine synthetase inhibition, that might be the cause of this severe nausea and vomiting that we've seen in studies like the Enigma trial. And uh, if you look at the published data, there's some tantalising suggestions that, that that's actually, in fact, the case. Um, this, this study was just published by Peter Nagali uh, and, and colleagues uh, just a couple of months ago in anaesthesiology, and they uh, uh, randomised 500 patients who were having a nitrous oxide-based anaesthetic to preoperative folate versus placebo. And they looked at homocysteine levels, and they showed something that we thought that we thought we knew before, but this confirms uh, that assumption that in fact you can suppress the rise in homocysteine elevation caused by nitrous oxide by giving patients preoperative folate. So it has a protective effect from that. This may protect from some of those cardiovascular complications. We don't know. You need big trials to um, to uh, to determine that sort of thing. 
but they actually measured the rate of PONV and they didn't actually pay any attention to it. But the rate of PONV in this study was reduced by three quarters in the patients who got folate preoperatively. And although this is not a prospective randomised trial looking at this, at this specific mechanism, it certainly suggests that this may be an underlying causative mechanism for nitrous oxide-induced PONV. But once again, this only relates to prolonged exposure and major surgery, not to minor surgery. The other issue that's, that's become uh, increasingly a, a hot topic um, is the issue of chronic post-surgical pain. Um, and this has arisen really out of the Enigma 1 trial and an inspiration that my colleague Matthew Chan in Hong Kong had to follow up the patients in Enigma 1 two years down the track with a structured telephone interview and to ask them about their, their post-operative pain outcomes. And the data from this study was absolutely... I was gobsmacked when I saw this, this data. I couldn't believe it. Um, once again, these patients had a wide variety of major surgery. There were 640 patients in the Hong Kong cohort of Enigma 1. They were a fantastic recruiting centre for us. So uh, this is by far the biggest study uh, to look at this particular issue. Matthew found that 11% of patients two years down the track had ongoing pain related to their surgery, wound pain, basically. A lot of this was abdominal surgery. And 9% of, of patients, in fact, reported that pain as severe still after two years. Now, I think this is, ter this is terribly worrying data. If this is what's going on out there that we're probably not hearing about because we don't see the patients again and, and our surgical colleagues don't seem to want to know about it, don't seem to want to tell us about it, um, this, this is a great concern. The, the remarkable thing was the nitrous oxide group, the, the risk of post-op uh, chronic pain at two years was halved. And I mean, that's, that's just phenomenal. I can't think of any other intervention uh, in the chronic pain uh, field which has that sort of effectiveness. Um, and once again, I think this is very important because if, if anyone's going to give patients nitrous oxide, it's going to be us. So we need to know about this. This was actually published in the pain literature, not in the anaesthesia literature, which I thought was a strategic um, uh, error. But any, anyway, um, it, it's, the word needs to get out about this. Now, the, the mechanism for this... We, we can speculate on it. It remains unclear. It, it may be related to NNDR receptor activity because we know nitrous oxide is an NNDR receptor antagonist and we know that that, that receptor is, is critical to the whole uh, concept of spinal cord wind-up um, and development of chronic pain in, in uh, animal models. However, Matthew, Matthew's done some animal data which suggests that, in fact, it's not mediated by the NNDR receptor mechanism and, in fact, may be um, related to something more more difficult to, um, to pin down, but maybe even an effect on DNA transcription. So the point being that it may not be that easy for us to replicate this effect of nitrous oxide on chronic pain outcomes with other drugs such as ketamine. We need a big study to actually see if ketamine can do this as well, and I'm trying to actually get that underway uh, in our um, multicentre research group in Australia, um, but uh, we don't know whether we can do this with other drugs. We're also looking at this in Enigma 2, so the Enigma 2 patients are having a one-year follow-up to look at chronic pain outcomes as well, using the same methodology. Um, and I can tell you at this stage, and obviously we're not going to know the outcomes of that for another uh, couple of years, because, um, or at least, at least another one year anyway, um, but in terms of just looking at the incidence of chronic pain in Enigma 2 uh, in a blinded fashion, um, it appears to be about 12%. So 12% of patients at one year have ongoing chronic pain from their, uh, from their surgery. And I find that quite alarming. Um, I'll just mention briefly the issue of greenhouse properties because it's sort of, it's, it's sort of the punchline of, of what I'm trying to get at here in, in the context of this meeting. Um, and I know Ollie's going to speak about this um, uh, after, after me, so he may have some, uh, some more... Uh, uh, detailed information to provide on this, but it's just as a general observation about the contribution of nitrous oxide to greenhouse gas um, pollution. Um, it's estimated that probably something like 1% of, of uh, nitrous oxide uh, pollution to the atmosphere comes from medical uses. Most of it's produced by aviation and the use of nitrogen fertilisers in agriculture. Um, those figures are pretty woolly. We don't, we don't know whether... That's not a precise figure, but it's, it's a rough estimate. Most of the... Of the um, commentary that's been published on this has been from non-anesthesia um, uh, commentators. Um, so uh, it, I'm just, I want to just put a, a, an anesthesia 
context on, on this data. Nitrous oxide is a powerful greenhouse gas. Its GWP is 300, so that means that one kilogram of nitrous oxide is equivalent to 300 kilograms of carbon dioxide at 100 years after, <coughs> after it's released into the atmosphere. So it's, it's a potent greenhouse gas. So are the volatile agents, but of course they're released at mu in much lower volumes um, into the atmosphere. However, they're quite long lived in the atmosphere as well. So deslorane, being a heavily fluorinated molecule, is quite stable in the upper atmosphere. In fact, its GWP is, is, over, is over 1600 in uh, most, most uh, of the publications on this, on this subject. So when you actually crunch the numbers on a MAC weighted basis of the sort of quantities of the volatile agents and nitrous oxide that you would use, um, the, the arithmetic's not that hard to do. By far the most greenhouse friendly uh, inhalational anaesthetic is a sevofluorane or isofluorane anaesthetic in oxygen or air. But if you're going to use nitrous oxide or desflurane, by far the best choice is nitrous oxide. The reason I make this point is because I know that because of a misunderstanding about this from a quantitative point of view, it's been very common practice in my colleagues back home in Australia who are climate conscious to think that they were doing us a favour by turning off nitrous oxide and turning on desflurane because they like the fast pharmacokinetics. And in fact they've been making the problem worse almost certainly. And this is one of the, one, an example of, of how not getting the science right before we make these decisions about the face of a drug, such as nitrous oxide, can lead us to make the wrong decisions. Um, so in conclusion, I would just put to you that the pharmacokinetic advantages of nitrous oxide have almost certainly been, un been underestimated and we shouldn't just dismiss them when we are working out which way to go with, uh, with the place of nitrous oxide. Uh, its toxicity is almost entirely related to its use for maintenance phase anaesthesia for major surgery. It doesn't have any significant, significant toxicity, I don't think, in brief or minor surgery or during its use in induction and emergence. Um, its chronic pain uh, uh, properties, pre preventive properties, need to be elucidated properly before we, before we consider giving it away. And in terms of its environmental um, effects, I think this is a good example of a clear indication for the use of low flow anaesthesia, preferably in an automated and target control fashion for the reasons that Andre was pointing out to us earlier, um, because it just makes it so easy to get down to really low flows and achieve smooth, uh, smooth anaesthesia. And I think low flow anaesthesia and, prop and automated low flow anaesthesia is going to be a critical place. If we decide we need to keep using nitrous oxide into the, into the uh, foreseeable future, we need these, uh, we need these um, uh, technologies to assist us to do that in an environmentally responsible way. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much.